few hours after Boko Haram claims responsibility for the abduction of the Kankara school boys, a shocking video emerges. And the House of Representatives rejects a bill addressing age limits for political positions. This is Plus Politics. I am Kayode Ladendi. Welcome to Plus Politics, a video allegedly containing evidence that a school boy is abducted from a government school in Kankara, Katsina State, was released earlier today by terrorist group Boko Haram. The video showed one of the abducted school boys pleading for the scrapping of vigilante groups the Irish, in Katsina and the closure of all schools, excluding Islamic schools. The boy is believed to have been first by the kidnappers to make the statement. In the video, the boy pleaded with the Nigerian government to recall all the soldiers trying to rescue them from the terrorists. And to discuss this, we have a security expert based in Abuja, Mr. Kabir Adamu. Good evening, Mr. Adamu. Good evening, Mr. Kayode. Yeah, uh, uh, I don't know whether to say good to have you because I know how sometimes you feel having to discuss this issue over and over again. But it's still an awesome time to have you join us tonight. But let's look at um, this latest video from Boko Haram. I recall that the military told us that uh, we should disregard the statement by the insurgents, the Boko Haram to be specific, saying that uh, they claim responsibility for the abduction. Now the Boko Haram, have, has, they've gone ahead to even release some video. How do you see this whole thing playing out? Uh, well, um, from the side of the government, the, uh, there is a need for them to better manage uh, the information space. In crisis, we are definitely in a crisis. Any country that has about 500 or, or thereabout of its uh, students missing, um, it's in a crisis stage. And in that situation, you need to deploy crisis management communication. And that means um, you should dominate the space with the kind of information you want uh, listeners and the public, as it were, to, to, to know. Um, not supplying the information now leaves space for others to dominate it. And in this instance, we have seen an attempt by Jamaat al ahl al al jihad to provide that kind of information, as well as several other sources. I mean, you just need to go online, uh, as well as the mainstream media, and you see different kind of reports being circulated around the incident. And so that definitely tells you that um, the need to dominate that space is more on the side of, of, of the government, given the fact that it has more uh, resources and wherewithal to do the, that type of this information dissemination. Now, regarding the video released by Jamaat al ahl al Dawati al Jihad, um, I, we can look at that video from three uh, points of view. Um, number one, the content, the message in the video. Number two, the video itself. And then number three, what you, we can you know, decipher from the video. Now, in terms of the message, it tells me clearly that this is propaganda by Jamaat al al Dawati al Jihad. Why am I saying that? Um, I tried to translate the Hausa message in the video, especially the command. When the boy was speaking, there was a man close to him, and the man was issuing commands, you know, directing the boy what to do. And one of the things he said was that tell, tell them they should stop attacking Fulanis. Um, and then tell them that the Fulanis have a right to live too. So clearly confirming, uh, you know, our earlier position that this is not Jamaat al ahl al Dawati al Jihad, but the bandits. Um, the reasons why we're saying this is oh, there is an age-long conflict between the Fulanis and Hausas in Kasina, and unfortunately in Kankara, um, the Hausa community created vigilante groups, and the vigilantes started attacking Fulanis. Uh, even when their women come to markets, you know, to shop, they will attack them, and then they will attack their villages and burn down the villages. So clearly, this statement confirms that this is a, a grouse, a you know, a conflict 
between the Houses and, and the Fulanis. And, you know, Jamaat al alisin al duwati wal Jad is attempting to capitalize on that. The second thing that is instructive is the mention of vigilantes. It's the Fulanis that have issues with these vigilantes, like I, I mentioned earlier on. And then he come, the statement in that video confirmed that as well. Now, that is not to say there is no link between these bandits and Jamaat al alisin al duwati wal Jad. Yes, there is a link, but it's a loose li link. It's not that these groups have been subsumed by um, Boko Haram or Jamaat al al final Dawati Wal Jihad. It's merely a strategic partnership that is meant to achieve uh, whatever purpose they want, they, they are, they're trying to achieve. In terms of numbers, the video does not really give us any indication of the numbers, even though the boy uh, the, that issued the statement did mention that there are about 500 plus, but what we could see from the video is definitely not up to five, 500. Um, however, uh, accounts by boys that have escaped or were released by the, the abductors, the kidnappers, uh, mentioned clearly that at the time of abduction, there were 520. But we know that a lot of them have escaped from the hands of the kidnappers. So it's um, a bit unclear how many are currently still with their you know, kidnappers and how many may have escaped. Okay. But um, if I'm going to have that... I will go with the governor's statement, which is 334, uh, or something between that 334 okay. and 400. Okay, Kabir, I, I, I truly appreciate this analysis, and, uh, and these are some of the things we'd expect the military authorities to give to us in terms of um, analyzing this video and uh, calming the nerves. You can imagine if you haven't done this, I, I don't know how many parents have listened to this kind of comment, to know that it is not so, you know, very, very clear yet to say uh, this was done by Boko Haram, the video being released. But it also creates this question, uh, uh, and um, a good number of security experts like you have said that there is a synergy between these bandits and the insurgents, I mean, the Boko Haram insurgents, so to say. So our, our worry now is, could there be some kind of training going on that we are not aware that the military ought to have nipped in the board for these people to be this organized. You remember one of the things said by the military was that they were using these schoolboys as human shield, hence they couldn't, you know, get at them. So how sophisticated are these bandits and what needs to be done as, sweet, as quick as possible? Um, the extent of sophistication of these bandits is demonstrated by the way they, are, they carried out this last attack in Kankara. Um, they obviously studied their target. They obviously knew um, the vulnerabilities in the school. They also had a fair sense of the security presence in Kankara town. Um, so that tells me there is a degree of tactical training and one of the information we're hearing, which is yet to be verified, is that one of the gang leaders is a returnee from Libya. Uh, possibly he went there as a mercenary or just as you know, a, an itinerant uh, criminal. Um, but that's one of the information we're, we're, we're hearing. Nothing suggests that he's a jihadist, uh, but it's possible again that he is. Um, then the gun running channels that they are taking advantage of um, without guns, they would they will not be able to achieve any of this. And in fact, in the, in the video, you saw them hanging AK-47s, and uh, perhaps they also have other um, arsenals that we, we didn't see in the video. In the video, so yes, uh, their level of sophistication is also determined by uh, this military or tactical training, as well as the weapon re, re, re in their disposal. And we know that um, not too long ago, the defense headquarters released information suggesting that um, bandits. Uh, are capitalizing on gun running channels that are coming from Libya in, into Nigeria. And, and in that report, they mentioned RPGs, um, AK-47, AK-49, and other uh, sophisticated weapons. So yes, these groups are morphing, they are metamorphosizing from small groups into larger organized gangs, mainly based on this kind of expertise that is coming in from the Sahel, as well as weapons that are coming in from the Sahel. Now, this is not in any way to say the military or other security agencies are not aware of this. They are aware, but they are not likely to come to the public sphere and discuss this type of things the, for the simple reason that um, security, especially national security, requires a significant level of confidentiality. 
um, you want to keep your information confidential. You want to make sure that the enemy is not aware of what you know. You want the surprise factor in your hands. But at the same time, you also owe it a duty on your citizens to explain to your citizens, reassure them, and give them confidence. So my advice to the authorities is to strike a balance between this need for confidentiality, um, you know, the secrecy of the activities, as well as the need to reassure citizens. I remember this was a point of controversy between the lawmakers and the president being, I mean, appearing uh, uh, on the floor that uh, security issues are not meant to be discussed publicly. Now, you mentioned that um, the, the kidnappers are using some kind of uh, propaganda. So can you just explain to us, that I'm talking about millions of people watching this, asking this question. What are the information they should know in specific terms now and the one that should not be discussed in the public space? For example, the issue of human shield. That sounds to many people like a flimsy excuse that uh, shouldn't the military know that there could be some collateral damage rather than having these children go for years like we had with the girls, girls in terms of... Uh, uh, when to get them out of the uh, kidnappers' den? So, um, human, human shields in every, um, you know, war situation is something that uh, should be taken seriously uh, for the simple reason that you don't want to jeopardize the life of innocent um, persons, innocent citizens. Now, what, what other military... Uh, you know, formations in other parts of the world do is to have tactical units with specialized skills and specialized weaponry that can go in in um, you know specialized uh, manner to take out the enemy and in that in so doing reduce the uh, you know collateral damage to to borrow borrow your 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 words. Um, now, uh, do we have that type of tactical units? Do we have those kind of sophisticated, uh, you know, units? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, we do have, yes, our tactical units, but uh, the kind of weaponry that is required for that kind of pre precision style invasion and rescue efforts, um, I don't think we've reached that, that stage yet. I'm hoping that that's something that our uh, government, the military and other security agencies will invest in going forward so that um, when we have delicate situations like this, we can have um, special units like the equivalent of the SEAL in the US and several other uh, you know, units across the world that have um, that type of expertise for rescue in very delicate situations like this. Now, in the absence of that, your best bet is to sustain the pressure, um, which, which is I'm very happy to know that that's what the military is doing. Uh, it appears they've been able to form a perimeter around where the boys are being kept, so making it difficult for the boy for the group to, um, you know, escape into the larger Sahel or down into uh, central Nigeria. And thus, you probably heard in the video, um, you know, them uh, calling on the military to stop the aerial surveillance uh, that you know they are currently given on the boys. Um, then I'm also aware aware that several other intelligence assets have been deployed. We know we shouldn't discuss that in public, but I'm aware that those kind of assets have been deployed. And so uh, to that extent, I think what the government is doing, given its um, ca capabilities and what the resources available to it, it's good and it should continue along that line while also opening um, channels of negotiation. And yesterday we had the state governor saying that he has already opened those channels of communication. So two things, sustain the pressure. Uh, and then open channels of communication that would allow um, some form of, um, you know, agreement to be reached for the, the voice to be released. Because at the end of the day, that, that should be our objective, the release of those voice. Yes, that should be our objective. And let's quickly stay on that objective. But later on, we'll also look at how to prevent these as a way of uh, learning from some of these uh, terrible situations that have happened. Now, a um, few hours ago, there were some conflicting reports that the boys have been released. And uh, we even have some major, you know, media houses like ours, you know, jumping on that story. Uh, in this kind of situation, uh, what could be wrong in terms of stories coming from where and uh, how do you even confirm such a story 
that uh, some media houses are caught in, in, in the mix? So um, in my field, you corroborate your sources. You have at least nothing less than four um, you know, levels of corroboration. Uh, over time, you would have formed an opinion on the reliability of your source. Uh, so if your source is highly reliable, you probably corroborate it with just one level. If your source has a reliability issue, then you probably corroborate the information you are getting with two or three other sources. So that at the end of the day, you would have done your part. And in this instance, when I picked, when I had that information from at least one of the major media houses, I put a call across to security professionals, um, you know, public security professionals on ground in Casino to ask for verification. Uh, I couldn't get that confirmation. So I put a call across the traditional rulers, especially from Kankara in an attempt to get confirmation from them. And then I also put a call, call, call across to sources within the government house. And so, I mean, you can quick, probably say, well, that's me because I have that, that, that type of means. I, I, I run a consultancy and that consultancy depends on its reputation. If, if I send out information that is fake and that is not reliable, my clients will not no longer you know, value what, what I send them. So I, I do all of that to ensure that whatever I put out there is reliable. And so that's what I expect the media to also do. Um, the media should have correspondence in on ground, in uh, location, and those correspondents should reach out to relevant uh, persons who have the need to know. In security balance, we have what we call need to know. We also have um, sources, reliability of the sources. So once the journalist understands all of this, he does his rounds, uh, corroborates the information, and of course, at that point, um, you can put it out. Of course, in certain circumstances where you're under pressure to release certain information, that caveat can also, depending on the issue on ground, you can always put a caveat depending on what the purpose of that information is, that this information is yet to be verified, verified but a particular source, if you are at liberty to mention your source, has mentioned, has mentioned it. In this instance, a government aide put it on her Twitter account. So uh, media houses have quoted that. I don't, I don't think they've done anything wrong. But then she also immediately put out a message saying that, her media account has been hacked. So it would only be fair for whichever media has quoted her to also do a follow-up report saying that um, this is the source of that information is saying that her media account was, um, her social media account was hacked, which is why she put out the phone. So bottom line, corroboration is very important and um, reliability of our source is also very important. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you are almost doing some kind of uh, <laughs> Uh, tutorials on uh, how to authenticate information. I quite appreciate that. And that's exactly what we did here on Plots TV Africa before we churn out such uh, kind of sensitive information. Let's quickly look at uh, how to avert these kind of issues. It's almost looking like, could this be stopped? What lessons have we learned if we thought this was just this can only happen in uh, northeast. Now we are having a dangerous trend in northwest. How can we, what should be done immediately? Are, are you talking about the school abduction now or general school security, abduction generally uh, and uh, anything that could have avert uh, this kind of mass uh, 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 kidnapping, you know, maybe not necessarily schools, but school as, as the basis now. So clearly, um, uh, we, the government signed a, a school, uh, safe, safe school declaration in 2019. Um, that safe school declaration is a global initiative, a global political movement that is meant to save, keep schools safe in conflict situation. Now, unfortunately, we, did, we signed the declaration but did not follow up on the implementation. So for me, that's the number one thing. Um, the federal, the state, and the local government should look quickly at that uh, declaration and seek ways to immediately implement that declaration. Um, the statistics at my disposal showed that we've recorded 1,400 attacks on schools from 2014 till date. It also shows that at least um, 1,300 teachers and pupils have been killed 
as a result of attacks on school. So there is enough information to tell us that our schools are not safe. And the consequence of that is very clear, especially in the North, where education is more or less back backward. All the indices on education show that the North is lagging behind. And so you cannot afford to allow schools to be attacked. And currently, a lot of states in the North have shut down their schools. So the prognosis for the North in terms of education is not very good if we allow this to remain. And therein lies the importance of ensuring the implementation of that safe school um, declaration. It's meant to um, serve three purposes. Number one, protect those inside the school community, the teachers, the academic staff, the non-academic staff, and then more importantly, the students themselves. Then the second thing is to also protect the community where the schools um, resides, and then largely to also protect vulnerable groups within the school community, such as girls who could be victims of gender-based violence, as an example. Now, um, that's what you want to achieve. And how do you achieve that? By implementing procedures, implementing uh, standard operating procedures, teaching um, teachers what to do in the event of an attack by an armed group, teaching students what to do, and then looking at the physical security in the school, the fence, um, the guards that are on duty and name, name them. Then the community, how can they be your ad added layer of protection? What kind of vigilance level would you um, introduce in that community? How do you invest that vigilance when they have information that the school is about to be attacked? So all of this is under that declaration. Now, what should the government do? Number one, issue a policy statement to ensure the implementation of that declaration so that all the ministries, departments, and agencies in government will now know that they have a role to play in the implementation of that declaration. And then number, number two, which is also critical, is the National Assembly should pass a law on that declaration so that it becomes the mandate for the implementation of that declaration. Okay. Um, that's Mr. Kabiru, very important. This that, 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 for me, looks like... Um more like a um, perfect solution, which might not be immediate. Uh, quickly, before you round off, because my, I understand my time is almost up for this segment, um, the governor of Zamfara State ordered that all boarding schools should be shut down. Uh, is that one of those immediate steps that other governors should uh, emulate? It's, it's an unfortunate step because I just mentioned how backward um, most North northern states are in terms of education. So imagine shutting down schools, uh, what that would mean for the, for the North as a whole. So it's an unfortunate step. Uh, I, I think it's actually a knee-jerk reaction. Um, it may be necessary, but I mean, there are more uh, immediate and more effective things that can be done, especially if you want to make sure your education, uh, you know, is not affected, given the poor statistics that the North has in terms of education. And, uh, one of the things that we could do immediately, especially for the governors, dominate and occupy those ungoverned space, those forests that are being used by these bandits to carry out these nefarious activities. Um, where they are shying away from that, and I honestly don't understand why. It, constitutionally, those forests, most of those forests belong to them. Uh, it's the big reserves that belongs to the federal government, but most of the forests belong to the states. Um, so come up with a strategy. You, you are faced with a situation where a significant percentage of your population don't have work to do. So engage them in one form or the other in terms of monitoring and dominating those forest areas so that these bad guys don't have the ability to use those forests for the okay. bad guys, bad things they do. And then the border uh, porosity, especially places like Zamfara, Sokoto, the borders are very porous. So um, work with the federal government to ensure better protection for the borders. So those are some of like immediate okay. things that can be done that would help in improving security and allow schools to remain open. I, I am not in support in any way of any governor shedding his, shaking his responsibility and shutting down schools. Okay. That would um, be more damage for the society and, in, the, uh, in the long run. Exactly, and that actually makes the terrorists to have their dreams being fulfilled. Thank you once again, Kabiru Adamu, for your intervention at this time. Let's hope that the next time we will call you, we'll be talking about the release of the schoolboys, and uh, we'll be talking more on the strategies to prevent another kind of occurrence. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Coyote. Hopefully, you call me by 12 midnight today to tell me that the boys I, have been I say amen to that. I say amen to that. Yeah, we will take a short break now. And when we return, the subject of age limit is once again before the House of Representatives. That will be all for discussion after this short break.